Scripture lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho, and he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So some scholars suggest that this story, which by the way is the very last story before Mark tells us of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that this story really brings to a close a section that started earlier in Mark's gospel back in the 8th chapter You may remember there's a story, another healing of a blind man in the 8th chapter in the Gospel of Mark. It's in Bethsaida that Jesus meets the man that's blind. And Jesus takes a little spit, rubs it on his eyes and says, can you see? And the man says, I see people, but they look like trees walking. So Jesus took the second step and healed him completely. 
And so some scholars suggest that we ought to see those two stories together. We ought to see this as the beginning, the Bethsaida story, story and the Bartimaeus story, again, sort of uh, in, in, uh, serving as bookends for this section. And, and if you look at it through those eyes, you really kind of begin to see things. We've talked in the last few weeks about some of the patterns in recent scripture. There have been questions around greatness in the last few uh, scripture text that we've looked at in, in recent texts around our reading today. Uh, the disciples arguing with one another about who's the greatest. Jesus putting a child before them saying, let me tell you what greatness is. James and John, you may remember last week, saying to Jesus, we want to sit at your right hand and left hand in your glory. And Jesus calling the disciples together and saying, you've got it all wrong. You're not seeing this clearly. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus continually giving them new ways of seeing what it means for them to think about their position in the kingdom of God. But if we put on our glasses, our seeing glasses, we might see other threads from Bethsaida to Bartimaeus. Right after uh, that text in the 8th chapter about the the blind man in, in Bethsaida, Jesus has that moment that you probably know very well where he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they gave him a variety of answers, but who do you say that I am? And Peter with the answer, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. He got it right. He saw that clearly. But then Jesus begins to tell him what kind of Messiah he is. Oh, by the way, I'm going to suffer and die. I'm going to be killed and I'll raise, be raised three days later. And you remember Peter's response to that. No, Jesus, you've got this all wrong. Let me tell you the plan. And then Jesus replied to Peter, you know very well, get behind me, Satan. You're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And time and time again, between Bethsaida and Bartimaeus, we continue to see Jesus talking about the kind of Messiah he is and the disciples just not getting it. We might say Peter in this moment saw it partly true. Certainly he had it right. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. He saw that, but he didn't see the fullness of what that meant. We might say that Peter saw, but the truth looked like trees walking. He didn't quite see. It was a partial seeing. And so there's this thread that runs from Bethsaida to Bartimaeus, where the disciples just see, but not fully see. Partial seeing. We walk through life sometimes like that, don't we? We see the truth, but not the fullness of the truth. And sometimes we mistake the full truth for the partial truth that we actually are seeing. It's interesting. I like the story of Bartimaeus, Jesus and the disciples and the crowd, very large crowd. They are in Jericho. We don't know what happens in Jericho. Mark just tells us they were in Jericho. Then they were leaving. And when they were leaving... There by the roadside is Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, sitting by the roadside, by the roadside. You know what kind of things you find by the roadside? If you ever clean up the highway with Fred Mott, you'll find out there's all kinds of things by the roadside here around Highlands. You know, by the roadside is where we might toss things out. By the roadside is where we put things that are not of value. You know, the road is where you get on if you are going somewhere, if you have purpose, if you have meaning. The one who sits beside the roadside has no purpose, has no meaning, cast away the outcast. That's where Bartimaeus is, sitting by the roadside. But he hears that Jesus of Nazareth is coming And apparently he sees something he doesn't see with his physical eyes. He knows that Jesus can make a difference in his life. And so he cries out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's a beautiful cry. But did you hear, did you see what the disciples and the crowd did? They sternly, Mark says, they sternly ordered him to be quiet. Shut up. This was not a polite gesture. This was one of anger, exclusion. You do not belong here with us. You are an interruption. You are an outcast. We don't want to hear what you have to say. Stay there on beside the road. That's where you belong. I read that story and I think about a moment back in the early part of my ministry. I've shared this with some of you before. I was pastoring four churches. My first appointment as a United Methodist pastor still had my radio career going and 
had my radio show from 5 until 10 in the morning. I had my four churches in Denton, and it was one night at Vacation Bible School. We were, I was in there with the adult class, and we were, we were wrapping up. It was kind of the end of the class time, and we heard the kids kind of playing. They were apparently going to do a little play of some kind, and they were choosing up parts in the room beside of us, and we heard their excited voices, and it was just kind of this chatter, this childish, childish chatter, but there was one voice that seemed to rise above the rest. It was the voice of little Allison Cody. And she knew what role she wanted to play in the little theater production. I'll be Jesus, I'll be Jesus, I'll be Jesus. And our reaction that night was just like yours. Well, isn't that cute? We just, we thought that was the cutest thing. And I filed that away in my pastor preaching file in the back of my head. And I thought sometime I'll use that down the road, maybe years from now. I'll recall this moment. Well, it was late by the time I got home, and I was tired. It was just one of those days I was tired. I'd done my radio show that morning. I'd come back, and I'd tried to be a faithful pastor. I had vacation Bible school, and it was late in the evening by the time I got home, and I was so tired. And when I walked in uh, our, our parsonage at that time, you would walk into the kitchen. That's right off the carport. You'd walk right into the kitchen. So I walked in, and there was my beautiful wife, Kathy. And before she even said hello, she said, I got a call from a man at Quick Check who needs help. He's been trying to call and get in touch with other pastors in the area, but hasn't been able to get in touch with anybody. And my first thought was, gee, I wish you wouldn't have answered the telephone. <laughs> and my second thought was, well, if he keeps calling, maybe he will find a pastor who is full-time, not part-time. Maybe he will find a pastor who doesn't have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go do a radio show. Those were all the thoughts in my head. Had no intention, quite honestly of going to quick check. Not an ounce of compassion stirred in my heart. The man from quick check to me was an interruption, an intrusion. I was tired and ready to go to bed. But just before I could make my way to the bedroom, a little voice echoed in the back of my mind. It was a voice I thought I had filed away for another day, it was the voice of little Alice and Cody. I'll be Jesus. I'll be Jesus. I'll be Jesus. And I couldn't make that voice stop until I got in my car and started driving to check, quick check in Denton. Sometimes those voices on the side of the road we just want them to stay there because they are an interruption, an intrusion into our lives. Things are on the roadside for a reason, aren't they? It's easy to walk past what's on the roadside. I see that in the disciples and the crowd when they sternly ordered the blind man at the roadside to be quiet. But then do you see what happens next? I am so proud of Bartimaeus. I love what Mark says. He cried out even louder. He turned up the volume. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Let's hear it for Bartimaeus. Let's hear it for the hope that will not be silenced in the face of despair. Let's hear it for the mother who will not quit praying for the wayward son night after night, year after year, with no results in sight. Let's hear it for the daughter who keeps praying every night that her dad will quit drinking so much. Let's hear it for the children who pray every day that mom and dad will quit fighting. Let's hear it for those who do not give up on prayer and will not be silenced. Let's hear it. For Bartimaeus, I appreciate Bartimaeus. And then Jesus stopped. Call him here, he said. And the crowd and the disciples, they say to him some really cool words, I think. Take heart, get up, he is calling you. Do you see what just happened? Do you see the miracle before the miracle, which may be the real miracle? These are the same people who were sternly ordering him to be quiet, just a heartbeat ago. And now because of Jesus, they are giving him a word of welcome and love and grace. Take heart, get up, he is calling you. Do you see what is happening in this moment? 
The crowd and the disciples see the blind beggar as something besides a blind beggar on the roadside. They see him as more than just one single story and they offer him grace and love and welcome. Do you see the miracle that is taking place in this moment? And then he throws off his cloak and he springs up and he comes to Jesus. I wonder why Mark gives us this little detail. He throws off his cloak. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's just a little throwaway comment, no pun intended. In John's gospel, John also often gives us details that mean something. You know, John never talks about night and day or light and dark just to sort of set the mood. Those things mean something when John says them. They have symbolic meaning. Mark, not so much. Mark doesn't give us a lot of descriptive words. Mark is very economical with his language. Mark's sort of the, the Joe Friday storyteller, just the facts man. So why does he tell us this seemingly insignificant detail? He throws off his cloak, springs up and comes to Jesus. I don't know. I wonder, I, I wonder if there's something Mark is telling us in this moment. I wonder... If this cloak represents something, certainly sitting beside the roadside, your cloak would be important. I would guess it keeps you warm. Maybe that's where he kept the coins that people would toss out the window. Maybe Mark wants us to even see this story in light of another story he tells just a few verses earlier. Remember the story of the rich man who wants to follow Jesus, and Jesus uh, loves him. He's done all the right things. And Jesus gives him one more task, go sell everything you have, give to the poor and come follow me. And remember what the rich man did, he walked away, couldn't let go. I wonder if Mark wants us to compare the rich man to the poor beggar. I wonder if that cloak is all the poor beggar had. I wonder in this moment if Mark wants us to see something of value in the willingness to cast off everything that is behind you, everything that is of value behind you for the risk of following Jesus. I'm not sure that's what Mark wants us to see, but that's what happens. He cast off his cloak and he goes to Jesus, and you know the rest. What do you want me to do for you? My teacher, let me see again. And Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. And you know what he does? He follows Jesus and the disciples and the crowd. And their next stop is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The next time you see a picture of Jesus and the triumphal entry and you see all the people around him, I want you to look for Bartimaeus because Bartimaeus is in that crowd. Well, I love this story. It's a valuable story. It's a story, I think, that says a lot to us. And I do think those scholars who suggest that maybe Mark is wanting us to see this as a bookend story with the Bethsaida healing story, I I see some wisdom in that. I wonder if maybe there are things that Mark wants us to see about partial seeing and total seeing. I wonder if Mark wants us to see something about the disciples and the crowd, the disciples who really couldn't quite see what it meant for Jesus to be the Messiah, the disciples who really couldn't quite understand what greatness in the kingdom of God really looked like, the disciples in the crowd who couldn't quite see the blind beggar beside the road as something more than just a blind beggar beside the road. I had, a, had an opportunity uh, this past week, actually, uh, to attend a workshop being conducted by the Harbinger Institute. Uh, for those of you who are working with me on this book study that we're doing, we're reading a book on, uh, by the Bar Arbinger Institute called The Anatomy of Peace. And they have another book out on the outward mindset. And so this workshop was on the outward mindset. Mike Merchant, who is the Arbinger Institute facilitator, invited us to think about the difference between an inward mindset and an outward mindset. An inward ma mindset, Mike Merchant shared with us, is the kind of mindset that we tend to have when we're arguing with somebody. We have that with our spouse or with a coworker, or a church member or a political adversary. I mean, fill in the blank, anybody that we can disagree with. We tend to very easily have an inward mindset, and that inward mindset is very closed. That inward mindset is a way of seeing that person, that other, uh, as the problem, as an obstacle that needs to be moved. I love what Mike Merchant said. It was one of those times where I wrote down exactly what he said. He said, seeing the other person as the problem is the problem. 
And so he talked about the problem of an inward mindset. And so if you are arguing with somebody and you both have an inward mindset, there's no reconciliation coming. You're just going to keep amping it up and amping it up. And one of the, he, he talked about the power of collusion in that kind of disagreement because we will get annoyed with the other and we will call out by our annoyance the very behavior that annoys us. And they will do the same to us. And before you know it, we're just going back and forth and we just keep getting worse and worse and worse. There's no reconciliation in that. But then he talked about the outward mindset. An outward mindset, it's a different way of thinking. It's a way of looking at the other, the one that I am in some conflict with, as a person like me, as a person with hopes and dreams and challenges and struggles just like me. And the key to all of it is seeing. Seeing. He gave us a, an object lesson. He put two chairs together on the stage just like this. And he said, here with these two chairs back to back, this symbolizes two people in disagreement, both with an outward mindset. And clearly you can see in this little object lesson, this person sitting here is looking there, this person sitting here is looking there, nobody sees one another. And as long as we continue to have an outward mindset, we will continue to ramp up the rhetoric we will continue to find reasons to demonize the other, and there will be no good end in sight. The key, Mike Merchant said, was one person turning the chair around. Now, you can't control the other person's chair. You only have authority over your chair. But he said, as he simply just did this object lesson, he said, no, what's different now? You have one person who can now see. You can now see this other person as a person. See that person maybe a little more in their for humanity, in their personhood, not as an object to be manipulated, not as an obstacle in our path. It is a way of beginning to see. Now, I, I don't think Mark was giving us an object lesson in human relationships. But I do think Mark was inviting us to see something more than just a physical healing of a blind man. I do think Mark is inviting us to, to be mindful of our own blind spots. And I hear in this little simple story of Bartimaeus an invitation to be a little more mindful of those who are on the roadside, those that it's easy for me to demonize or dehumanize. My hope and my prayer is that somehow through the grace of God that maybe, just maybe, one day we will all find our answer in Jesus. And in so doing, we will begin to look at one another with the eyes of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.